It's uh, Valentine's Day, February 14th, and we are working our way through Chapter 3. We're dealing with the property tables, and um, I have a question on the floor from Problem 323. So I'm going to flip over to the document cam, and we're going to work through the third line down on 323. Okay, so if we... If we take a look at the data, problem 323 tells us that we are working with water and we are also in SI units. The third row down, we are given a temperature in degree C of 125, a pressure in KPA of 750 and we want to know our specific volume in cubic meters per kilogram and also the phase description. All right, so in each and every case we go back to the idea of the two-phase diagram where somewhere we have sets of conditions where we have um, liquid and vapor combined and over here we're going to have a steam quality value and this could be either pressure or temperature but let's just say pressure for example and then this would be specific volume All right over here we would have a compressed liquid and x is not applicable right I should say x is not applicable there is no value of x over here and out here we have a superheated vapor. Once again, X is not applicable. And at the top of the chart, we have the critical point above which we have a supercritical fluid. So the principle that we use is that temperature and pressure are independent except in the two-phase region. In the two-phase region, they are dependent, and we need a third variable to describe where we are in the tables. All right, so we're going to take a look at water at 125 uh, degrees centigrade and 750 kPa. So the first thing I'm going to do is to go into the property tables. Now, the copy of the property tables I have here are extremely similar to the property tables you have. However, this is the sixth edition of the textbook and you have the eighth probably. So it may look a little bit different, but the material is inherently the same. So since we're dealing with water and since we're in the SI units, we want to use the first set of tables, a, the A dash number without an E on them. And we go to going down there we are all right and here we are saturated water temperature table what this means saturated water means these are the sets of conditions that will keep us in the two-phase region so if there's more heat or more specific volume it would be a superheated vapor if there is less heat or less specific volume we would be a compressed liquid so since this table is organized by temperature I go to 125 degrees centigrade and I see that the pressure that will keep me in the two-phase region is 232.23 kPa. All right, so at 125 for the set of conditions, let me put this over here. I'm going to write over here to the document cam. So at 125 degrees centigrade, the saturation pressure is approximately 232 kPa. So my pressure is quite a bit higher, isn't it? So what phase does that put us in? We have too much pressure to be two phase. It's a compressed liquid. That is exactly correct. Now, there are tables for the compressed liquid, but they are pretty inadequate. And the deal is, is that, um, think about liquid water. Whether it is 
only slightly not gassy or very not gassy, is the specific volume going to be similar? In other words, it's not a compressible fluid, is it? It's incompressible. Water in the liquid form is incompressible. So what that tells us is, is the density and the specific volume, as long as it's 100% liquid, is going to be very similar. The other part is, is that all thermodynamic properties, which we'll just call Y, are stronger functions of temperature than they are of pressure. So that means if we were to pick up the specific volume of water at 125 degrees centigrade liquid, it's going to be almost the same regardless of what the pressure is because increasing the pressure is not going to significantly change the volume, is it? All right. So if we zip back over to our uh, property tables, we can see here 125, and we can see a V sub F, right? This value right here. We also see V sub G. At our conditions, the value of V right here is V sub F, and the value here is V sub G. So that means that our specific volume is approximately equal to V sub F at 125 degrees centigrade, which is uh, 0 0.001065, 0 0.001065 in units of cubic meters per kilogram. Now, to make a stronger point, just to sort of emphasize this, uh, look at the values of V sub F as we increase temperature do they increase very much? They really don't. On the other hand, look at V sub G. Do they change significantly? Holy cow, absolutely. Now, let's continue. I just want to show you some more tabular data here. If we find a temperature table that is instead organized by pressure, look at the values of V sub F. They're all the same to the fourth decimal place, to the hundred thousandth, or to the tens of thousandths place. So, there's almost no change in that value. Now, even though we have inadequate uh, compressed liquid tables, let's go ahead and take a look. Here's our superheated water, which is the other side of the table. Lots of good data. And superheated steam is really interesting. OK, here's our compressed liquid water. We are at a pressure of 750 kPa which is 0.75 MPA. So you can see that this little table, the top table right here, is quite a bit more pressure. But if we take it down to a temperature of about 100, we don't even have 125, but we take it to 120 degrees, what do you see about the specific volume here of this highly compressed liquid compared to the specific volume of V sub F at 125 degrees? They're still, they're almost identical, right? So I'm going to write this down just so we can compare. 0 0.0010576. Okay, and so I'm going to flip back over here to the document cam. Look at how similar those values are. They're, sim they're, they're identical to the fourth decimal place. They're all 0 0.0010. And then we have a five instead of a six. So we're almost off. We're, we're not off until we get to less than a percent. So is that helpful? It's a really good question. And if you have an equation solver, this will pop out at you, but you'll never get that idea about how compressed liquid doesn't change very much in terms of the specific volume. So it's a very good question. What else would you like to know? Um, just to clarify, so sure. Is the saturated mixture just uh, phase where it's liquid and vapor? Exactly. Okay. And the, the, the reason, if you look at it, the pressure and temperature are the same. There's a single pressure, a single temperature. I mean, single temperature for a single pressure, right? There's many sets of pressure, temperature. But for that given pressure and temperature, on this side, steam quality would be zero. On this side, steam quality would be 1, and it's a linear relation across. And that relationship bears out 
for any of the properties in the two-phase region? Yeah, good, good question. Yep. Anything else? All right. Well, let's see. Did you guys do 27? I mean, so you're okay? Are, did you, um, do you guys, are you comfortable? You know, like, for example, a number um, 27E, the fourth one down where we have a pressure of 180 PSI and an H value of 129.46. Are you comfortable calculating the X value? Yes. Okay. Well, I'd like to work a couple of those for you because that's that was kind of what I was hoping to do today. So, if you guys were all awesome, we'd just move on. But I most people don't get that the first time. Okay. So we're going to take a look at 27E because this goes beyond a little bit where we not just we're not just asking for a phase description. Uh, but we're involving X, which is the steam quality in the calculation. So this becomes a little bit more involved. Now, on the one, I, I'd like to do the second one down. And let's see. The, I'd like to do the first one and the second one. Let's do that. On the first problem, we have a temperature, which is not given. We have a pressure, this is in PSIA, so once again, we have to flip over to the proper tables. We're going to go to the English unit tables, right? And we're also working with R134A, the refrigerant. <laughs> so, um, and then we're using the value of H, which is enthalpy in BTUs per pound of mass. And we have a phase description. Okay, now here's the deal. Anytime you have a value of X, anytime there is a valid value of X, the phase description has to be saturated fluid two phase. Okay, you're in that two phase region. There is no X that exists for compressed liquid, supercritical fluid, or superheated steam. So if there is a value of X, you're in the two-phase envelope, right? Similarly, if you're in the two-phase envelope, you have a value of X. And if you have a phase description that is not within the two-phase envelope, if it's one of those other three, you will not have a value of X. The answer for what is X is NA, or not applicable or does not exist, okay? So let's take a look at the first one. We have 80 PSI and an H of 78. 80. 78. Okay. So once again, we go back, we always go back, and you're probably going to say, why does she keep drawing that two-phase diagram? Because I want you to have this, uh, this is the main technique that you use for isolating where you are. So um, we could have this be pressure and this be specific volume. Uh, we could also have it be any other uh, thermodynamic properties. So in other words, if we are in the two-phase volume, H here is going to equal H sub F, and H here is going to equal H sub G, and over here, H is going to be greater than H sub G, and down here, H is going to be less than H sub G, because, or excuse me, H sub F, because we're always in this idea that the two-phase envelope is in the middle of compressed liquid and superheated, and because of the state postulate, we can always determine if we're not in the two-phase region where we are on either side. So if we're at 80 PSI, the first thing we want to know is to determine if we're in the two-phase region at 80 PSI with an H value of 78. So we check to see at 80 PSI is H equals 78 BT per pound mass somewhere in here, or is it greater or less than? So that's the first thing that we want to do. So we go back to the podium PC. And we try to find our property tables again. Okay, only this time we're going to go to the E tables because this is in um, 
this is not in SI units, so we want to go to the tables that have uh, designator E. And of course, I don't have the same page numbers as you because I'm working from a different edition, so I just have to kind of brute force it here. There we go. So now we're in our tables that have one or A dash number E, meaning that we're going to be in English units. We need to go down further until we get to the steam tables or the property tables, not for water, but for R134A. So we go past superheated and compressed water, and that's our saturated ice water vapor. Those would be our sublimation tables. So you go past that, and here we are for refrigerant, but we don't have a temperature. We want to go to superheated, or, or excuse me, saturated refrigerant pressure table. So I want to go to the pressure I'm given, which is 80 psi. And I see that the H value on the lower end, my H sub F, is 33.394. And my H sub G value is 112.20. Check my units. Those are both in BTUs per pound mass. So if I go over to my work again, what do I see about this value of 78? Are we in the two-phase region or are we on one side or the other? We're in the two-phase region, aren't we? So this is two-phase or saturated fluid or whatever, but saturated refrigerant uh, or saturated fluid. That means that my temperature has to be the saturation temperature at that pressure, doesn't it? Because otherwise I would not be in the two-phase region. So I go back to my table and at 80, PSI, my saturation temperature is 65.89 degrees Fahrenheit. 65.89 degrees Fahrenheit. And all that's left to me is to calculate my value of X. Okay. So if you recall, we had an equation that said any thermodynamic property is a function of y sub g, y sub f, and x, right? And we wrote out that equation uh, in this form, that y is equal to y sub f plus x times y sub f g, where this is the difference between the property of the gas and the property, or the property of the 100% saturated gas and the 100% or the 0% saturated gas. So my y value is 78. My y sub f value is 33.394. And this is equal to this plus x, which is my unknown, times the difference between these two. One what did, I can't read my own handwriting here. 112.20 minus 33.394. And I can solve this for x, right? So if I bring up my little calculator, I start by saying um, 70, all right, let's just go ahead and do this subtraction. And there may even, the, y, the H sub FG column, I guess this is the easiest way to do it. I never, I never think of using this. But H sub FG is the difference between this and this. So if I go down there, I don't even have to do that calculation. I can just use that number, which is 78.804. But if you don't have that number, you can see how easy it is to subtract. All right, so to find it, I take 78 and I subtract from that 33.394. And then I have uh, this value is 44.606. And that's going to equal X times this number 78 point. You want to see this other screen, sorry, hang on. There we go. Um, 
x then will be this number divided by 78.804. So I take that number, divide it by 78.804, and I get a value of x is equal to 0.566. So what does that mean? Well, it means right in the middle, x would be what? If it's 0 here and 1 here, what would it be right here? Yep. So we're just off to the side. And what that means is that 56.6% of the mass of the fluid is vapor and the remainder, 43%, is liquid. Okay? Questions? Good? All right. So let's do another one where we're given an x value and go ahead and figure this out. So the next line down. Uh, let's see, I'll just put it underneath. We are given a temperature of 15 degrees Fahrenheit and an X value of 0.6. Okay. Since I am given an X value, what phase description do we have? Two phase. Cannot be anything else. That means we are in the two phase envelope, period. It is not valid to have an x value in a single phase. All right, so we're still working with saturated refrigerant, only now we have a temperature and an x value. So if I go back to the, te the tables for refrigerant uh, based on temperature, and I come down here to 15 degrees, since I'm in the two-phase region, this has to be my pressure, doesn't it? It's the only pressure at which liquid and vapor will coexist for that temperature. So my pressure is 29.759 PSIA. All right, so how am I going to find my H value? Well, for the second line, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll switch over just a minute. I have to find my H sub G, my H sub F, and I can find that H sub FG, it may come in handy, based with my uh, X value, I can determine what my H is for 0.6. H equals what? H up 0.6 equals what? All right, so in the tables, my H value is 16.889 for zero percent quality steam and it is 105.27 for 100 percent quality steam and in case I need it the H sub FG value is the arithmetic difference of those two 88.377 right well I can use this formula to find my H of 0.6. So it equals Y sub F, which is 16.889, plus my X value, which is 0.6, multiplied by my H sub FG, which is 88.377. If I perform that calculation, I start with uh, 0.6 times my HFG 88.377 and add to that my HFG value of 16.889 and I get a total of 69.9152 in units of BTU per pound mass. Okay, so if I take a look at the document cam again, I just used the values from the table, plugged it into my formula, and calculated my H value. So you can see 
that for this instance, if my H sub F is 16.9, roughly, and my H sub G is 105.3, roughly, and my H of a 0.6 is 69.9, within the same units, I would expect this number to be slightly closer to this number than to this number, right? And it is. So does that all make sense? If I got an H value that was blown out of the two-phase envelope, it was higher than H sub G or lower than H sub F, would have done something incorrect. It would not be correct calculation. Okay. okay. Any other questions about that? All right. So this will go on and on and on and on forever. So you really need to understand how to do the steam tables to get data out of the steam tables. Um, and I don't think it's too severe of me to say that if you're not able to do this, you will not pass thermodynamics. So don't let it, if it's not comfortable to you, come see me, work with your classmates, watch some YouTube tutorials, do whatever it is until you're comfortable with this. Okay. Well, let's put it. To Yes, the whole thing. Using the table, relating the table to the diagram, knowing when you're given two properties what state that fluid exists in and how to find the other properties at that same state. Yep. So there you go. All right. So let's do, let's put this to, let's put our money where our mouth is. Let's do a problem that kind of builds this in, okay? Let's take a look at um, let's look at problem three dash forty one. Three dash forty one in your textbook on page one hundred fifty four. We have ten kilograms of R one thirty four A at 300 kPa, and it fills a rigid container with a volume of 14 liters. First thing is rigid container means the volume at time two is equal to the volume at time one. If it's rigid, the volume is not going to change, okay? Uh, determine the temperature and total enthalpy in the container. The container is now heated until the pressure is 600 kPa determine the temperature and total enthalpy when the heating is completed. So on 341, we actually have two states. We have the initial state and we have the final state. Okay, And we know a couple of things. We know that the volume at time two is equal to the volume at time one. Volume at time one is equal to the volume at time two. And of course, we know that because we are told it's a rigid container. We're also told that the mass at time one is equal to 10 kilograms. Okay. Now, in the problem, we heat the container, but there's no mass that leaves the container, is, do we? Is there? So in other words, the mass at time two also has to be equal to 10 kilograms. Do you see why? There's not, if, if, it were a, if it were a kettle and we boiled some of it off or we poured some of it off or we added something, the mass wouldn't necessarily be the same. But this is a rigid container and all we're doing is adding heat. Heat doesn't add mass, so we're going to have the same mass at the beginning and at the end. Uh, we're also told that in both cases we're working with refrigerant R134A. Uh, and we're told that the volume is 14 liters. Okay. Um, initially, the pressure at time one is 300 kPa. But then we're going to add some heat, which adds energy. And we can't increase the volume. We can't increase the mass. But we are going to increase the temperature by some unknown amount. And our pressure is going to also increase. This is just like heating up water. You have a pressure cooker on your stove and you 
and you turn the heat underneath it and it heats up. Uh, the pressure then becomes, actually doubles, 600 kPa. And the question is, what is the temperature here? And what is the temperature here? And what is the enthalpy here? So the container is now heated, determine the temperature and total enthalpy. All right, so that's what we need. So we can work with state one and then we can work with state two, All right? State one is kind of a, there's one little thing that we need to be able to see. We know the mass and we know the volume. So what is the physical property that we can determine? If you think about the tabulated data. I heard it. We know mass and volume, which one of these properties do we know? Specific. Yes, specific volume, don't we? Because specific volume is just volume divided by uh, mass. Now I'm in SI, I'm right now my table is in English units. I need to go back to my SI units. And so that's gonna be over here. This is water, 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 water. There we go. Saturated refrigerant. Okay. So uh, the first thing I want to do is to, I see that my specific volume is in the tables is in cubic meter per kilogram. And so I need to do a conversion on my data. Yes, sir. Sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. I just want to make sure I wasn't ignoring you. You had a question. Okay. So, um, we need to have our volume in cubic meters per kilogram. So what is the conversion between liters and cubic meters? Does anyone remember? Is it a thousand? I'm going to the back of the book. To volume and one cubic meter is a thousand liters, okay? So if I do my calculation here, uh, I can say specific volume at state one is equal to my uh, volume, 14 liters times 1,000 liters per cubic meter, and divide that by the number of kilograms, which is 10, kilograms, and so I get my specific volume at time one is uh, 14, I'm not going to pull up the calculator, I don't think you need to see it, uh, divided by 1,000, divided by 10 kilograms, and that turns out to be 0 .0014 cubic meters per kilogram. Okay, now this may also give you, if you think about a liter, like a small milk carton or a big bottle of water, a thousand of them in a cubic meter, a cubic meter is a huge volume, isn't it? It's, a very, it's, like, it's very close to a cubic yard, it's bigger than a cubic yard, but um, it's a very, very large number. All right, so now at state one, I know my specific volume and I know my pressure. So I can use those two values to determine if this is a two-phase fluid, if it is a compressed liquid, or if it's a superheated gas. And the way I do that is I go back to my podium and I want to go, I have a pressure of 300 kPa, so I want to go to the pressure tables. Right there. Go down to 300, okay, we're in between 280 and 320, so I'm halfway in between those two. And if I take a look at my specific volumes, I go between 0 .0007 and 0 .07. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, and we're in between 280 and 300. Um, we're at 300, we're exactly at 300 degrees, we're exactly between them, so we can average them, right? So at 300 
KPA. Uh, I could say that uh, V sub F is halfway in between those two values, so I would just say, you know, I'm not even going to carry it out, 0 0.00076. Six. Point zero 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 seven six six, and that's in units of cubic meters per kilogram. And V sub G is halfway in between those two point zero. I have to do that on my calculator. I can't do that in my head. Um, just I'm going to take these two numbers point zero seven two three five two. Add to that uh, point zero six. 3604 and divide it by 2 and that upper value is 0 0.06798 cubic meters per kilogram. Okay, let's flip back over the document cam. All right, so I have a value of V sub G or V sub F and I have a value of V sub G. Okay, Wait. yeah? Did I pick them up wrong? Let's take a look. Okay, so here's 280, here's 320. It's between 0 0.07 and 0 0.06. Do you pick up the long line? Yeah. Okay. All righty, good deal. So we come back over here. The first thing is my T1 is going to have to be my, temp my saturation temperature there, isn't it? Okay, so if I go to 300... Um, if I look at my, see, and this is since we're, since we're talking about refrigerant, it saturates at these low pressures at a very low temperature, which is why it's a refrigerant. So at 280, 320, we're going to be halfway in between negative one and a half degrees and positive 2.46 degrees, right? So if I take those two values... 2.46 and subtract from that 1.25 and divide it by 2, I get a saturation temperature of 0 0.605 degrees Celsius. So we're just above the freezing point of water. Now how do I find my H value? Well, the answer to that is I need to use, I need to find an X and then I need to work with that, right? How do I find H? This is H1. Let's see, I'll write it over here. So first of all, we're gonna find little h1 because this is what's tabulated. But I know that little h1 at this, whatever this is, is going to be H sub F plus X times H sub G minus H sub F, I believe. Check my formula again. Yes. All right. Now, uh, and then of course, capital H, because it asks for total enthalpy, is little h times the mass, which is 10 kilograms. So that'll be an easy calculation. But we need to find x. We can find x using our specific volume and the specific volume of the liquid phase and the vapor phase. This is our specific volume, right? So in other words, we're going to say uh, find x using specific volume. We have our specific volume, and we can pick out v sub f and v sub g from the tables, calculate x, plug it in here, pull the values of H sub F and H sub G out of the tables and calculate our H sub 1. Then multiply it by the mass in order to find the total enthalpy. All right, so let's do that. I'm looking at the tables again. Uh, we're in between the two values, so our a V sub F value is in between these values, just like we calculated. Our V sub G values is in between those values. And so I'm going to say that um, 
0.0014, which is my value of V sub F, or of V, excuse me, is equal to a V sub F plus X times the difference between these two. Right? Or I could just, I could have picked that up out of the tables, uh, but I didn't want to do another average. 0 0.06798 minus 0 0.000766. So the difference of those two is uh, 0 0.067214. Okay, so I take this number, subtract this number, and divide it by this number to get my answer for x, point zero zero one four minus point zero 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 seven six six divided by point zero six seven two one four. Point zero six seven two one four and I get an x value. It's quite small. Uh, point zero zero nine four. So that means that I am at about a ten percent uh, in the vapor phase, ninety percent in the liquid phase. Okay, I can believe that. I can then use that to find my H sub one based on my H values, which I need to pick up out of the tables. H sub F. H sub G, okay. So right in between those two values, right between here and here, uh, H sub F is about, it's bet halfway between 50 and 55, so let's say it's 52 and a half. I'm rounding a little bit just because I don't want to do the math. And then we can actually just use the H sub F G value because that's, um, let's do that instead of doing H sub G, let's just H sub F G since we have a handy. We're halfway in between 199 and a half and 196. So it's about 198, more or less, 198. And those are in units of uh, kilojoules per kilogram. Okay, you probably would like to see the calculations. There we go. All right, so I just wrote those numbers down there. Those are estimates. They're close, but I didn't actually do the arithmetic. So therefore, my H at state one, using this idea, is going to be 52.5 plus my X value, 0 0.0094 times 198. And my little H1 is, I'm doing the calculation, Point zero zero nine four times 198, add to that 52 and a half, and my value is 54.4 uh, in units of kilojoules per kilogram. It asks us for total enthalpy, which is capital H1, so that's equal to H1, little h1 times the mass which is 54.4 times 10, or 544. When I take kilojoules per kilogram and multiply by kilogram, I just have kilojoules. And so that's my answer for the first part. Okay, now I'm just gonna set up the second part for you because the calculations can be a little bit tedious, as you probably see, but it's still important work. Yes? So, like, can you justify the X for small because R134A, yeah. Yeah, so that, like, they can't all transfer to the gas to solve. Right, that's a really good point, because it all works together. You would have to really pull a tremendous vacuum on it to get it to vaporize, yeah. is so what it wants to. justify that it's so small? Oh, no, but that's a good point, and it works together. But the reason that we can justify it, I mean, mathematically, is because if you look at our value, 
of specific volume that we've calculated, it's just a lot closer to be Sebastian than to be Gucci. So, in other words, but you're getting at the correct idea, yeah. which is that you need a bigger container or you need less pressure, which would require, you'd have to do something, you'd have to, you would just have to pull a really strong vacuum on it to have that much mass in there and still have that low. Can't be that low here. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly right. And you kind of get into those weird supercritical fluids, or you can, well, you just get into some weird places. So it's hard to say if it would actually happen at all. I mean, we could figure that out. But yeah, but it all works together, and you are, you're correct. You need more space, less pressure, or less stuff in order for it to happen. Yep, good question. All right, now I just want to look at the second part. I'm going to have you do this for your homework. Uh, but let's take a look at the final conditions. We still have the same volume, and we still have the same mass. So since specific volume is volume divided by mass, does it make sense to you that the specific volume at time two has to be equal to the same as the specific volume at time one? Okay, now that's because the pressure's different, our temperature is going to be different. We may still be in the two phase region, or we may be either a compressed liquid or less likely a superheated gas. But the specific volume has to be exactly the same. So in other words, with the second part, with the final state, we have specific volume, we have pressure, we can still define the state and do the problem for state two, can't we? Okay, so that's your assignment. That's, that's, that's what you'll do is problem 341. I'll put that in your homework. Um, you can recognize that the first part of 341, the, the initial state we've already done, but the final state will come out exactly, uh, you'll be able to do that calculation. But it's not intuitive that the specific volume is going to be the same. So you have to kind of work the number and say, well, yeah, of course, it has to be because the mass is the same, the volume is the same, so it has to be the same. But when you increase the pressure, it's intuitive to think that you would uh, also increase the specific volume or decrease the specific volume and increase the density, and it's not true. Okay? So you might ch you'll change the phase behavior, but in a different way. All right, so that's problem 341. And the last problem that I would like to give you, um, I want to give an English unit problem, maybe involving water. Okay, let's look, and I'm gonna help you set it up. So you're gonna have two homework problems tonight, 341, which we just did half of, and the other one I'm gonna have you do is 337E. Right? So I'm going to do a little bit of setup for you on this one. We have a pound mass of water. So it's water. One pound of mass. And it fills a piston cylinder device. Okay? So we have some volume at time one. Uh, and we have a temperature at time one. The piston cylinder device is now cooled until the temperature is... Um, 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, if it cools, the volume at time two is not equal to the volume at time one, is it? It's, a, it's not a rigid container. It's a cylinder with a piston in it. And so the piston falls, and the volume at time two is not equal to the volume at time one. Okay, so one pound of mass fills this much. So we know the mass and we know the volume at time one, so we also can calculate the specific volume at time one. And we also have the temperature at time one. Okay, so once we have specific volume and temperature, we can fix the initial state. Piston cylinder device is now cooled. We know that the mass here has to equal the mass at time one. So there's nowhere for the mass to escape. Uh, but it's cooled until the temperature is now 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's think about the pressure. If you know the pressure at time one and you allow this to cool, heat goes out, but what's maintaining the pressure here is the weight of the piston, isn't it? So the pressure at time two is the same as the pressure at time one. 
In other words, once it is, reaches equilibrium, the pressure is going to have to be the same because it's determined by the weight of the piston. Make sense? If you think about a piston in a cylinder, okay, and if you're not weighted and you don't have a spring and you're not restraining that piston in any way, it's just going to rise and fall based upon the, the gas, right? It's going to just rise and fall. So it will decrease. I mean, the volume will decrease, but the pressure is going to stay the same unless it's acted upon by something outside. Otherwise, it would move up or down until the pressure equalized. So make sense? So the pressure at time two is equal to the pressure at time one. So in other words, here you will know the temperature and the pressure. So you can fix the state. Here you will know the pressure and the specific volume, or the temperature and the specific volume, so you can fix the state. <coughs> Sound good? Alrighty. Well, that's it for today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will post those homework problems. I will post the vodcast, and we'll see you Thursday for more fun with phase behavior. <laughs>